G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope you are super well. Today I'm with Mr. Bruce Connolly. Bruce, I've known for, I think about 20 years, Bruce. I think it was 2000. I'm, I'm afraid we're that old, man. <laughs> 2004, we first met. We've been great friends ever since. Today, Bruce is an avid Sony user. And as you can see, we've got an enormous range of Sony gear on the table. Bruce, talk us through some of what you have here. Well, I'd also like to point out, though, that I might be predominantly a Sony user today, but over the years, when I started when I was 12, and I have to tell you that that's more than 50 years in the middle, it was first Canon, then it was Nikon, which I still use and still have them, uh, Leica, and then Sony. While I don't recommend anyone today go and swap brand A for brand B, um, because it's you're typically not going to get anything better than you had before, um, there were some real fundamental reasons for it over the years. Yeah, well, across those decades, which you're talking about five, there were some paradigm shifts that occurred. That's that's exactly right. When when I started off with uh, Canon F1, Nikon, the F2 AS, was the dominant thing. Canon was very much uh, the one that was had to be an up-and-comer. Right. Had to be whatever. But it was really AF and EOS yeah. that, that put them in the position that you know that they almost are today. Right? Now, isn't it amazing how the fortunes shift across the the decades? And I think, you, as you said, we would agree that today, really, they're all in pretty similar positions. But so we, so I want to talk to you about uh, why the Sony A7R5, why the Sony A7CR. As you said, it was Leica before. What happened? What happened with your Leicas? Well, let's let's look at the the CR. I mean, when the CR was announced, um, I think it's fair enough to say that it was most of us were kind of underwhelmed. And, and the reason is, is that when you just look at a, 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 a spreadsheet to see what features it has compared to um, compared to its bigger brother, yeah. and the fact that in Australia, when cameras are announced, the camera stores gouge you for the six months or a year. Yeah, you get the early uh, adopter right. or early adopter that's tax. Right. You've got an early adopter tax. You had a situation where a camera with remarkably, remarkably less features, particularly only one slot, was at the same price or more expensive than what is a proper professional piece of equipment. Yep. What was even worse, of course, is that at that particular time, anybody knew in photography, the Z8 was announced. And anyone who wanted to do the great sweet spot of wedding photography, portrait or whatever, there's hardly a thing that the Z8 really doesn't do. So the, the, uh, the CR really didn't have a lot of early adopters, as far as I can see. And people like me, eventually, though, um, people like myself always wanted and a lot of professionals always go on holidays. And they want something light and small, but functional that has really good resolution, etc. And originally I bought Leicas for that, and I started off with an M9. And behind you there, as I said, is a picture from, it's one and a half metres tall, and it's from an M9. And the fact of the matter is, is that unfortunately, virtually in every professional situation that I've faced with a Leica camera, it's broken down. Yeah, it's amazing to hear that because you don't hear that very often. But you've been telling me for quite a number of years about issues and cameras having to go back to the Leica factory and then it can be three or six months. Oh, absolutely. Until the, you get it back. Look, it's very unfortunate, but it's happened to me on multiple occasions and it was very expensive because I had a job to do and uh, I had to do it in Paris, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And um, I had an, an M9, and eventually it, the sensor cracked. It Which I've never heard of an, any, any other sensor ever cracking. Cracked, yeah. and um, and uh, I went immediately to a Leica store in Paris, who said because it was an Australian camera, it had to go back to Australia to then be shipped to. That's right. To Leica. That's right. Wow. There was a whole lot of issues, um, and uh, so in that particular job, I had to rush back to the hotel room and get my trusty Nikon D800E. There you go, that's a beautiful sensor. Which? 36 megapixels of right. non-anti-aliased non sensor. How good's that? And there's still plenty of pictures in this room now that are well over a metre in size that are 
you know, are taken with that. Now, I just wanted to touch on that. So Bruce talks a lot about printing, and that's because the reason I met Bruce is that he runs a business called G Clay Media Supplies and has been supplying Australia with paper and canvas and other substrates along with some of the framing materials. And a lot of what I did and many others did was to print large. So Bruce, you and I, we know a lot about how to squeeze the most out of our 35 mil sensors, don't we? Because we've both been doing it a long time. Oh yeah, um, you know, I mean, I, I I read a lot of forums and uh, you know, I don't know why I read them sometimes because there's actually very little value in a lot of them. Sure. Right. One of the most common forums nowadays is the Fuji GFX versus the Sony A95, right? Oh, sorry, A7R5 and A7CR, right? Which is the best of these things, right? And I actually have both cameras. There you go. Right? Right? Yeah. I actually have both cameras. And how many people on that forum do you think actually have both of those cameras? Oh, I'd Two? Say, I would say very, very few. Yeah. But most of most of the people look at the size of enlargements simply by multiplying out the number of pixels, yes. suggesting that somehow that has to do with actual picture quality. Image quality, absolutely. And as somebody who has in the back of me, in this particular room, we have three wide format printers. There used to be four. And there's yes. a fifth upstairs of which we print uh, in inches, 60 by 90, 60 by 100 all the time. And you should be able to that's see right. the Canon in this mask. Which, just tell everyone which Canon you have over well, there. Well, that's, that's the Canon 6100, which is a 60-inch printer, and there's a couple of other Canons over there. One of them is the newer ink set, uh, which is with the waxy type inks, etc. The size that you can print has very little to do, in a lot of cases, with the number of pixels that the camera actually has. Mm. And, you know, there's plenty of images here, like behind us, the images that are well over one and a half metres in, in size that were taken with 40 megapixel, 42 megapixel cameras. And because of the digital treatment that you can give these things nowadays, they're bullet sharp all the way. Uh, yeah, even, even when it says we can see here, uh, what is that? That's almost a two metre, is it? Uh, it's uh, or 1.8. I think it's about 1.8. How you treat things with your processors later, not necessarily the number of megapixels. For instance, in the case of the Fuji, um, a machine that I actually love, but I love it because it has a four by three ratio. Yeah. And it works really well for what we do here is copying art. This four three ratio works really really well indeed. And also, if you're going to do a long panorama, it has these things built into it or whatever, it's very effective. But the lens you choose, the aperture you shoot at, which is probably one of the biggest determining factors is diffraction, right? The ISO that you shoot at, because anything above 100 ISO on any of these cameras is extremely noticeable. Even at base ISO, both the Fuji and both Sonys are quite noisy. Mm. Right? But, of course, when you normalise that to a 45 or a 24 megapixel sensor, they're not. Yeah. But you do have to denoise them if you want the size. Yeah. And the first thing in the process for all of these cameras is a denoise, number one step. Then you can apply other software later for up or whatever, but the denoising is mostly the key. And the last thing is the lens itself. Mm. And, and they're not all made equal, are they, Bruce? They are not, more, they are not, made, uh, they are not made equal. And uh, if you have a Sony, you have probably a lot more choices of lenses than particularly you do with a Canon. And one of the things that you find is that you read things in these forums. For instance, the most trashed company I've seen is Samyang. And yet it's probably my most used lens system because it's tiny, it's lightweight, and quite frankly, some of its lenses considerably either equal or outclass the same Sony lens. And an example is this 24mm Sony G GM, which I use a lot. The 24mm Samyang f1.8 is at least as good at every aperture. It's interesting, isn't it? And it, it, it says to me a lot about how, you know, uh, there's a lot of third-party Chinese manufacturers and, it's, you know, it's a lot of, they're kind of almost immediately disregarded by a lot of people when, it's, when it shouldn't be the case. Well, Like, I think Viltrox is doing a lot of good stuff. Well, I mean, well. there's plenty of reviews to show that the Viltrox 135mm 1.8 is equal or better to the Sony version, which I 
you personally use. Yeah, right. Now, and I would, they've just come. That's just been announced. That's just been announced. Yeah, now, yeah. the question is, is that would I would I stop using the Sony one from the Viltrox? No, and I'll tell you why. Because of weight, mm. right? Yeah. Weight matters a lot to me, one way yeah. or another. But I do believe that reading a lot of these forums, we have a lot of opinions from people who don't actually own things. And I have yeah. to say, we've got a lot of talking heads which make a lot of opinions about lenses that they don't use in practice. And when you ask what professional photography do you actually do, I don't see them. Yeah. Look, it's a it's a it's an exciting thing about our space is the the delineation between people who uh, actually have a lens mm -hmm. and and on top of that actually use it real world as opposed to you know not real world because I think that's different as well. Like if you t if you can use a lens in your studio and just shoot the same thing over and over again. Well, again, if you do if you do like it's these lens tests. Yeah. You know these lens tests. Pick them up and throw them in the rubbish bin. First thing is you're dealing with something <laughs> at a set distance. Yeah, yeah. Right? At yeah. a set distance. Exactly. Now, when I went to university and did optics or whatever, I don't think I'd pass the bloody module if I did something like that and claimed the entire performance of the lens based on just yeah. a single distance. Just on five metres. That's right. Now, I can give you an example. Another GM lens, which is here, which is the 18, sorry, which is the 14 millimetre GM f1.8. At infinity, this lens is actually reasonably good for a 14 millimeter. But anything close range, which you often use these things for, its field curvature is so bad that you have to choose between blurred centers, blurred middles, or blurred corners. And yet it's the best of the lens of its type, let's, yeah. let's be honest. But the truth of the matter is, is that if you just formulate an idea based on a single distance, you won't see any of these other problems. Yeah. And that's really what bothers me about these things. Well, that's that's what, uh, I suppose that's to me what cherry picking, testing. That's exactly what it is. It's creates. cherry picking, testing. And what I ultimately find personally is that l lenses and cameras are made to be used in, in the field. They're not actually made to be used in a test, on a test rig. So shouldn't we be using them you know, where, where shouldn't we be testing them where they're supposed to be used? As a well, point? yes, and 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 the people that you should listen to are the people that actually use these things day in day out. Now, I'll give you another example of things that really make me sick. Right, one of them is this sensor is terrible because when I underexpose it, six and a half stops. <laughs> God, it blocks its shadows and it's green. Yeah. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, if you have an EVF. How, how do you possibly underexpose six and a half? Like the EVF is a live view of your exposure. You shouldn't be a photographer or a filmmaker if that's what you're doing. But yet you see these things yeah, I, one way or another. I, I, and yeah. and, and the, the, the fact of the matter is is that Canon has been panned for this for many years, but in practice, the you know, I enlarge to very large sizes everybody's digital prints one way or another. Mm. In practice, if you got your exposure anywhere near correct, Right, all three brands will do very well. Thank you. Very yeah, much. I mean, maybe maybe we come from the place where we shot transparency film, and so your latitude might have been what quarter five, quarter five. of a stop or half a stop or something. Well, you got you got about five stops of dynamic range and a quarter of a stop on Kodachrome. You could see it. That's what I'm saying. Whereas today, if we push any base ISO file from any camera two three stops, they're still hanging together. Yeah, look, look, that's we're just so spoiled. Yeah, look, we are so spoiled and we have to realise that. Yeah. And, and you know, we need to focus on photography, on composition and above all else, things that make us a return on our investment. That's true. And in Australia, the photographic industry has all but collapsed. Yeah, well, you would know because you sell to all of us. That's right. And, you know, the lab industry in particular hardly exists. Yeah. And I don't know if there's a truly profitable lab in the country right now. And that's a shame. It really is. Right? Yeah, well, th things keep shifting. But obviously photography, I mean, I, I don't know what the numbers are today, but I would say that enthusiasts are now the bulk of purchases of 
cameras and professionals are a oh. very small percentage. Oh, absolutely. You had Leicas, you had difficulties with your Leicas. How did that end, end you up with a camera that essentially appears to have a same or very similar sensor in it to well, it's exactly, the latest Leicas? It's exactly the same. Talk us through that. Well, I mean, uh, I went, look, the Z9s ultimately, sorry, the, uh, the M9s had to ultimately be uh, replaced with M240s. And the M240s were better cameras. They, they were better built, and uh, however, they, they still failed. They used to fail with white, un, in, inexplicable, inexplicably white shots, dark shots right. all over that. Sometimes you, they were so light or dark you couldn't see them. And, uh, you know, there, there were many, many problems. I always wanted the best lens with the best sensor. And for yep. years, I thought I really wanted a Leica with a Sony sensor in it because yep. many of these things would go away. And when they started obviously doing that, right, um, when the M11 came out, I, for one, um, uh, were, you know, I was extremely happy. I thought this is the machine that I can finally take light. I have all the relevant lenses and, and it'll be fine. It'll be the best of the best. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out like that. Myself and others um, had inexplicable lockup problems. And just like everything else, um, whether it was an SD card or whether it's the basic electronics in the camera, etc., in the professional sense, you just can't afford it. No. Now, I've had every Sony R camera, R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the CR. Yeah. My total number of failures in all of those cameras and all of those usage is one minor failure in an OSS system which um, had to be tuned up and just didn't work properly one way or another. And, and that's what it's all about. I can't afford the failures. Nikon, zero. Zero. And that includes the Arctic and the Antarctic. Zero. Yeah, they're, they're professional tools. That's, that's what they are. And so thus, after Leica trauma... Yeah, look, um, when the CR was announced, initially I didn't buy it simply because all the negatives that people said. First of all, it's only got one card slot. It's an SD card slot. I, th I thought surely we could have a CF a Type Express, but whatever. Then, of course, the viewfinder was meant to be... The EVF was meant to be so terrible that no one could actually see through it, so you definitely trash it for that. Um, and then there were so many other things about it. But eventually I decided to buy one because the new adopter tax went away and they dropped in Australia over $1,000 in reality. And, of course, after actually using it, the first thing you, you discover about it is that it takes really good photographs. I mean, it's every bit as good as its bigger brother. The lack of, um, you know, the, the lack of uh, a full mechanical shutter, does it matter in practice? No. Can you use the viewfinder? Yes. Is, there, is, is, the, is the single card slot really a problem? No. Um, what you find is, is that the actual size of the camera is a problem. Even myself that doesn't have the biggest hands in the world, without the grip on the bottom of the camera, it's virtually impossible to use. You get a very, very uh, stiff Hand. But luckily, that actually comes with the particular camera in question. And when you arm it with small and light lenses, for instance, particularly the 24mm Samyang, this is an exceptional optic. Right. And Bruce, you were showing me some images from, you, you just picked up the brand new 85 1.4 and that was working a treat on it as well. Oh yeah. Look, the 85mm 1.4, um, you know, it's meant to be a small light lens, but you know, you guys can see that. And that is the Betas f1.8 version. You can see there's 10 years difference almost in these lenses, but the size difference is, is you know, quite significant. And the fact that this is stabilised and this one isn't. But it is, used, it is used on these cameras and, you know, it's probably the maximum lens that you can use on them with... with uh, yeah, I was going to say, so ergonomically, you're comfortable with the 85 1.4, but if you were to stick a 70 to 200 on there, you'd... you'd... Well, the 70 to 200s, um, the, the f2.8 is... Um, the Sony is quite light, it's, yeah. but, but it's physically quite large. And uh, I do think it's too big for this to, to use it, but the, the f4 
is a treat. Yeah. Yeah, it would be similar weight to the 85, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, it's it's a treat. It's a nice lens um, and, and the fact that it's got a close focus in it, which is very, very useful or whatever, really means that you can travel with this particular lens in question, right? So ultimately, and the funny thing is Bruce made a confession to me when you were thinking, you rang me up when you were thinking about buying yeah, an I A7C. Did. I did. And you said, Matt, I have to confess, I've been buying Leicas for a while and I, I never wanted to tell you. So, so ultimately, does this mean that like... What, what what does it mean for you for the future of Leica and the future well, of, you know, when the sensor, we all believe it's the same sensor, maybe with a different colour array, maybe with different glass on the front of it. Well, I think one of the key issues for us right now is, is that um, if we wait a minute and go out there and get some Leica lenses, I tend to use this with some of the Leica lenses. Mm -hmm. Now, what people probably don't realise is, is that while all Leica lenses, virtually all of them will attach to a Sony camera, those that particularly sit in the roughly the 20 to 50 millimeter range really have very poor performance at the edges because of field curvature, mm -hmm. simply because the thickness of the uh, glass over the sensor plate is different between the two cameras. But the longer lenses, 75, 90 and 135, M's and also the shorter ones like the Voigtlanders in the 15 millimeter areas don't have any of these problems at all and are attachable and they make a very small light combination every bit as good as the original Leica ones were. Mm -hmm. And later we can pick out, for instance, one of the exceptional lenses for its size is the 135 millimeter Leica APO, mm. which nobody, I don't understand why somebody doesn't make an AF equivalent of this because it's literally tiny for the, what it gives. And what actually people don't realise is that it can be used with a Sony teleconverter. Oh, wow. Oh, yes, because, because it's a manual lens. And, and how, how long is this 135? Like well, that? we'll get one out and I'll... Oh, yeah, all right. Let's get one and yeah, I'll go, show you. Go grab it. We'll, we'll just... Uh... So Bruce not only is a uh, owner of G-Clay Media and creates his own papers and substrates and so on. But he's also a software engineer, software architect. And so he does lots of different things, but also a photographer, with which we can see some of his images around the room here. And uh, he's travelled to some places that I would I'd love to go, like Iceland. Uh, he's been to see the Puffins. He's As, as he said, he's been to uh, North... Uh, the North Pole and the South Pole. You've been everywhere, Bruce. All, all well, places I haven't been. So hopefully one day I can come with you on one of these trips. Because they, wow, look at that. Right, that, that's 135 millimeter yeah. f3.4. This is the current APO version. Now, if you pick this thing up, it's not exactly light. No, it's, it's really, dense. It's got a lot of glass in it. Oh, that's no, right. no, no, it's not. It's not. It's dense, but not heavy. Now, this is only a five-element design. Wow. And that's all it is. Wow. Right? You know, you can stick a Sony teleconverter on the back of that and it will work because the aperture is manually set here. And because uh, the, all the Sonys have focus peaking, they actually focus really well with Leica because the light, the thread and throw on a Leica lens is nice and it's aggressive nice and whatever. Smooth and so slow. So you yeah. can throw one of these in your bag, and it's a hell of a lot smaller than a uh, you know a, a seventy to two hundred f two point eight. So, so this is a really interesting thing to me, Bruce. Is basically basically from a lens perspective, you're still hundred percent love Leica, but from maybe from a digital body perspective, you're a little a little bit wary. I mean, I don't want to put words words. Well, in mouth, but... look, the the answer to the question is is that um, I mean. Don't get me wrong, I love a rangefinder, right? Um, my eyes aren't as good, but uh, and I still think a rangefinder is the quickest way to focus a wide-angle lens, mm. right? But, you know, for the money, uh, we need a few things which are obvious. The first thing is we need uh, focus confirm. It's not, it's not important on a Leica M to, um, to have an automatic focus system. What is important is that when you hit the focus on the eye that you're told that it's there. Mm. You don't have to automate the lens itself. You can do it with your hand. It's so simple. Why isn't it there? Yeah. The second thing is, is, is that having to put an EVF on the top of the camera is just not on. Yeah, not when you're spending 15 grand in this country. That's right. You're spending more than 15 grand in the country, right? right? right. And uh, because the whole point of these cameras is that they're flat and they can be packed away. Yeah. But And so, therefore, taking the EVF off, et cetera, you know, it's one of the, the difficult things. The 21mm Leica f3.4 
is as good today, years after it came out, as some of the best Zeiss 21s, and it's tiny, absolutely tiny. And you can't use it on these cameras because of the field curvature issue. The real issue comes when Kalari does a conversion to this camera to use thin film on it, for which I know there's several examples Fred Miranda's is out for conversation. And if they successfully do convert this camera, it basically means you're going to get a machine that's going to equal the Leica M with all the Leica M lenses that can autofocus them with the the, uh, the EM9, EAM9, I think it is adapter if you want it. And that's going to be very hard for three and a half thousand dollars. And by the time this comes around, they'll probably be selling on the used market in Australia for two something or other. It's going to be very hard to justify something more than that. Mm. Oh, well, it's look, it's always what we see in this industry is it's always leapfrog, you know. Uh, Leica will be aware of this. They'll be seeing videos and forums that are talking about this and then they'll have to think hard about what, what's the M12 all about and maybe they will, maybe they'll address uh, some of what you're talking about. Well, they have addressed, well, you know, they have addressed things over the years but very, very slowly. Mm. Right? If you make money out of this, and this building is all about making money out of photography and printing, yeah. you can't afford a failure. No, you can't. No, you I mean, just can't. Yeah, I mean, look, my my experience with cameras is the same as yours. I, I've and and I've been a working photographer for thirty five years, and you know, I always take two or three bodies with me just in case. But it's never, it's never, it never ha happens. Never. Ha it? I'll no. tell you one time I had a problem. I had an assistant who must have been working with Canons, and they put the lens on kind of the wrong way. Oh, that's right. Put it on the wrong way. And it, got, course, yeah. and it got stuck. Yeah. And I had to just put that camera down and say, we'll fix it later. And we shot with one of the other bodies. But that, that's about all I've ever faced. But there's another area of failure that I notice here because we make big prints. And one of the things we notice is eye autofocus failure. Mm, interesting. You know, eye lash for autofocus isn't the money shot, <laughs> right? It just isn't. You're right. You're That's right. Right. You're right. And it has to be eye autofocus. And one of the things, despite the fact that this camera is small, under the worst light conditions that I faced on the weekend in in an underground car park with LED and fluorescent lights flashing all over the place where I couldn't see the model's eyes, this thing not only would lock onto them, it wouldn't let them go. Yeah, and you're shooting handheld with the 85 at one, right. at 1.4 with a pretty slow shutter speed, and yeah, and it's still, it, it's it still nailed there. it nailed it all. And and the point of the matter is, is that you know, I mean, I didn't really put any effort into doing this. No, well, I mean, the cameras are at a point now where you can either kind of make it all manual again and choose to shoot like we were just 20 years ago. I mean, it mm -hmm. wasn't that long ago that we had to do most of the work. And now, 20 years later, we really, you know, we're, we're coming down to what composition is still up to us. Uh, well, yeah, competition. De 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 depth of field, if you're leaving your uh, manual depth of field. Well, as I, said, as I said, when I saw that image, when I blew it up and I had a close look at it, I said at the distance, which is a full bodied shot, we're, t we're talking about roughly half a centimetre behind the pupil of the eye is visibly out of focus. Yeah. Right. And it's that accuracy. And, you, you know, if you want to get paid and you want to blow these things up, you can't afford to miss. Yeah. And you don't get second chance. Well, it sounds like, to uh, wrap this up, that for now, the Sony A7R5 and the AC, man, like A7CR, <laughs> these names, uh, are, are where you're going to be. And we'll see what the next generations hold. Well, I mean, uh, I do have A9s here. Yes, right? um, but that's an A9. You don't have an A9 III. That's an A9 III. No, I don't have an A9 III. Um, and the reason's pretty simple, that somebody like myself doesn't want to shoot with a base ISO of 250. Yeah, fair enough. Right? And, you know, there are sports photographers. We keep on seeing them. I don't know of any sports photographers that are actually in Australia, in Melbourne, that make what I would call a decent living. Yeah, they're, they're full time or whatever. I mean, you'd have your uh, ones that work for papers or agencies, yeah, but maybe not, that not, not freelance ones. Yeah, they? but they don't get to choose their cameras; they're given them. Yeah, of course, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, most of the people that I know want a an all round camera that doesn't black out, 
that shoots maybe 20 frames per second, any more than that's kind of like overkill one yeah, way or another. for most people, yeah. And they do want a lot of megapixels because if they want to crop. Mm -hmm. And to do that, right in the Sony land, and then above all else, the one thing that they want and every Canon user wants it and is getting it, it's pre-capture. Yep. Pre-capture. Well, not every user, but yes, those that want it. Well, want even, in, want it. even in the case of weddings, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But there's a lot of other things besides burning and weddings. But sure, I hear you. I understand. But, but that's it. I mean, because because you're more likely to get the money shot. Landscape photographers don't really need pre-capture. Mm, <laughs> well, we, we could talk about it, but in real terms, we don't. Well, really. when you when you when you want to shoot in Iceland, when you want to shoot a puffin coming yes. in on your landscape, but that's wildlife. That's wildlife. Well, perhaps so. Yeah, so, so. Perhaps so. But uh, I think now that all. Hopefully, in a year's time, all three brands will have 45 or more megapixels and pre-capture. Oh, yeah. Then I think, the, I think the manufacturers are going to have a hard time selling us another camera. Yeah, it's making us change brand, you mean, or, or just, or or just do, buying a new camera? Anything, because they're going to do just about everything we ever wanted. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to think what the future will hold. I mean, I made a video six months ago saying I think the kind of the spec wars are coming to an end, and you've basically said the same thing. But there's still, you know, could we see more dynamic range and could we see higher ISO? And we can see Canon now going into this predictive autofocus stuff where it actually looks at the scene. But I don't, I don't want that. I don't need that. That's that's very specific for sporting photographers and so on. Oh, so, I think yeah. You're... So they will try and create things, uh, better and improved and more seamless cloud services. But it's maybe it's at the... called upsetting the homeostasis. Yeah, that's well, how you do. That, that, that. That's that's right to make you buy something else. Yes. But I would argue that all of those things can be had with software, and the, the machine that you currently have today is probably going to do it. Oh, look, if got, they we, want to, we do have amazing technology today. Mm. Well, Bruce, uh, you know I'm going to get you back because you are a wealth of photographic information, both from the camera and lens side all the way to printing and so on. So um, this is just the very first of our chats. So I thank you for sharing your journey with Sony, which has been as long as mine has. We both bought the A7R and I and I, I bought it in 13. Did you buy it in 13 as well? Yep. I yep. bought it initially it came out because it was light and it had the third and it had the that's, sensor of the D800E. That's right. And I thought this is my travel camera because the rest broke. Well you and I bought it for exactly the same reason. So there you go. All right. Well thank you Bruce. It's been an absolute pleasure. Please everybody do let us know in the comments below what do you what do you think about the conversation, the idea that the the two Sonys that you can see here are essentially a, a Leica for much less, and especially the compact, the C version, it's pretty astonishing because essentially it's it's five times cheaper for the body. Something, well, in Australia, something but, in that. But order. I think the issue is you buy it because in a, if there's a Kalari conversion for it that's successful with Leica lenses, particularly if the white balance issue is fixed from Kalari, then. I think it's going to be hard not to buy one. There you go. All right. Well, I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you again, Bruce. Uh, it's been so good to see you. And if this is your first time here, I would love to see you again. So please do subscribe. All right. Catch you later. Fair enough. Great work, Bruce. Love your work. Yeah. Look at, look at <laughs> we we shake on the. <laughs> but truly, oh. that's... it's it's a beauty.